Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or good morning if you're on the West Coast, if you're joining us from Israel. Good evening, Erev Tov. Thanks so much for being with us. We're going to begin in just a brief moment, so stand by and we'll get on with the show. <clears throat> A lot of legends on this call. <laughs> hey, Art Cratchman. Stan Pluchak. Marty Rigger. Oh, cool. All right, we have a whole bunch of people filtering in, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Thanks for joining us today. We have an awesome guest with us, and I, we also have an awesome moderator with us. And I'm going to introduce, before we get to our special guest, I'm going to get to our, our moderator, Brian Schiff. Uh, Shifty, this is the fourth event you've hosted for us, is that right? Uh, yes. Zoom off, Larry Brown and Larry Needle. Terrific. Usually I only do Larry's, but I'm making an exception <laughs> today. All right, Shifty. Uh, he has been a Maccabi USA volunteer since 1998 when he took the USA Junior Boys basketball team to the ninth Pan American Maccabi Games in Mexico City. Shifty went on to coach seven more Maccabi USA Junior basketball teams, four times in Israel, once in Chile, Argentina, Berlin, and he has won gold medals every single time. Shifty's also part of our uh, 21st Maccabi Organizing Committee, and he is one of our sports commissioners. Uh, professionally, Shifty was a 30-year member of the media. He's been a writer, editor, public relations director, and producer at Comcast Sportsnet, where he won an Emmy and was nominated multiple times. Since 2018, Shifty has been a member of the athletic department at Abington Friends School here in the suburbs of Philadelphia, and he serves in a variety of roles there as head coach of the middle school basketball and girls softball teams. And now you can add a Maccabi USA guest moderator to that resume. So Shifty, thanks for everything you do for the organization, and thanks for leading us today and connecting us to John. And I'm going to stop talking and you're going to take over. Okay, Shane. Well, thank you for those overly kind and uh, extremely humbling words. I'm honored to be a part of Maccabi USA in whatever way that can be. So our guest today, as, as Jewish people, of course, one of the things is that we are known as the people of the book. And there's no Jewish person I know who could signify that more than our guest today, John Feinstein. He's the author of more than 35 books, including the two best-selling books of all time, a season on the brink and a good sports book. books. What's that? Sports books. The Bible's the best selling book of all time, Brian. Yes, sports books of all time. It did say that I missed that. Um, and a good book, Spoiled, which were both New York Times bestseller. He also has written 10 books for kids. Um, one, which is called The Last Shot, which, by the way, I am in, which won the Edgar Allan Poe Award for mystery writing and also was a New York Times bestseller. His book, Where Nobody Knows Your Name, was his 23rd New York Times bestseller. And his most recent book, The Back Roads to March, chronicles the unsung and unheralded heroes of college basketball. But that's not all. John is a longtime columnist for the Washington Post. He's worked for the Golf Channel, Golf Digest, Sirius XM Radio, CBS Radio, and Comcast Sportsnet, NBC Sports, and all those. He's the winner in 2013 of the Kurt Gowdy Award at the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame there in Springfield, Massachusetts. He was inducted into the National Sports Writers and Sports Casters Hall of Fame, the U.S. Basketball Writers Hall of Fame, the Greater Washington, D.C. Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. Amazing resume for John. He was born in New York City. His father was heavily involved in the arts and was the general manager of the of the uh, Washington National Opera from 1980 to 1905, and was also actually the first executive director of the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. John, of course, he, most people who know him knows he is a proud alum of Duke University, and he currently lives in Potomac, Maryland with his wife, Christine, 
and his three children, Danny, Bridget, and Jane. Um, as Shane said, I got to know John while I was a producer, uh, like the coordinating producer for guests at Comcast Sportsnet's Daily News Live for many years. John started coming on as a guest, talking about sports in general, talking about you know, helping promote his books, which we love doing because they were all great and all fascinating. And um, I could say he's one of those people, he could talk about anything in the world of sports and probably anything else too. We only talk about sports with him, but he could talk about anything. One of the most knowledgeable people I have ever met. Um, and so John, I just want to, uh, on behalf of everybody here, welcome and thanks. Brian, it's good to see you. I haven't seen you in a long time. I have heard you. Uh, on the phone and on text, but uh, it's good to see you again. I miss those days at Comcast Sportsnet uh, when Daily News Live was a staple and I would come on frequently and you would always bring me a celebs pizza at the end of the show. And, and uh, for the rest of you, because I, I was coming on today, Brian actually had two pizzas sent to my house uh, this morning. I had no idea what the heck was going on eventually figured it out and delivered one of them to my wife's school. She's a Montessori school teacher right near here. So now I am a hero among the faculty at the Manor Montessori School. So thank you, Brian. That's beautiful. So, all right, so let's get into this, John. So you grew up in New York City. What, uh, what originally started your interest in sports? What are your early sports memories? My earliest sports memories, Brian, are playing everything. Uh, we lived right across the street from Riverside Park it's a small park near Riverside, you might imagine. Uh, and my friends and I played uh, baseball, stickball, uh, touch football, basketball. There were four basketball courts uh, in the park. Only one of them was a full court. Everything else was a half court and no, no baskets, just rims. Um, but I, I played everything as a kid and uh, became a sports fan very early on. Uh, I have the misfortune of being a lifelong Mets fan, a lifelong Jets fan. Uh, I became an Islanders fan in high school because uh, they were an expansion team, and I always liked expansion teams. I was a Knicks fan as a kid, but gave the Knicks up when Pat Riley became the coach because I hated the way they played and don't particularly like Riley either. Uh, so I grew up as a New York sports fan, and, and, and I also – it wasn't just the pro teams. Uh, I used to listen to Columbia basketball, Seton Hall basketball, St. Peter's basketball on the radio, on the student radio stations. I was a fanatic. Uh, and it, people always point out that my dad and mom were both in the, in, in the arts. My dad, as you said, worked at the Kennedy Center, the Washington Opera, the National Symphony Orchestra. Um, my mom got her PhD in music history from Columbia while raising three children and then taught at both Columbia and later George Washington when my dad got the job at the Kennedy Center. So I sort of went 180 degrees the other way. Uh, in fact, I once wrote a magazine piece on my dad and the, the headline was the Mets versus the Met. <laughs> As I talked right. about being in the car on weekends and I would try to convince my dad to put the Mets game on the radio and he would go, oh yeah, the Met is on. And the next thing I knew we'd be listening to opera. So. Uh, I don't know why I, I, I went in that direction, but I've always said my father was very passionate about his work. And uh, I've always said I, I, I inherited my father's passion. I just directed it in a different way. That's great. And by the way, staring at the screen here, I see Ari Ackerman is on, Ackerman is on the screen of the Marlins. So we want to wish them good luck in this series. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. We just Thank did you. a show with him last week as well. Um, how about uh, Jewish athletes? Did you have any influence of Jewish athletes growing up? Like I love, of course, like every Jewish kid, I loved Sandy Koufax and Hank Greenberg. Well, um, you, know, you know, I never thought of athletes particularly as being Jewish or being black or being white. I, I grew up in a very mixed neighborhood. There were Jews, there were Hispanics, and, and, and there were black kids. And that's why when I went to Duke, it was a culture shock for me. Uh, to meet people who thought that somehow being Jewish was different or being black was different. Uh, I had a roommate my freshman year who was from Morganton, North Carolina, the same town that produced the great Senator Sam Irvin who led the Watergate he hearings. He was a really good guy. And he said to me very honestly uh, that he was very glad to have me as a roommate because he'd never met a Jewish person before. 
So it, it was very different going to Durham, North Carolina from the west side of Manhattan, to say the least. But yes, I was certainly aware of Sandy Koufax. I remember him not pitching game one of the 1965 World Series because it was fell on Yom Kippur. Um, I knew of Hank Greenberg as I grew up. But the Jewish athlete I was probably most aware of because I was a swimmer was Mark Spitz. And uh, I remember Spitz winning the seven gold medal medals in Munich. I was in high school at the time. <laughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and that, of course, was the same Olympics where, where the, the 11 Jewish athletes were murdered. So that made me very conscious of being a Jew and of Jewish athletes. But I would say I was very disappointed when I found out later I got to know a number of guys who had been teammates of Mark Spitz who said, yeah, he was a great swimmer, but he wasn't a great guy. That was very disappointing. Well, I'll throw a quick one. Mark Spitz came up to me at the JCC Maccabi Games. Um, his son was uh, trying out, was going to try out for a team and was injured. And he came up to me to talk about it. And of course, this was a total goop. But he came up to me and he said, aren't you the guy who's going to be the coach in the Maccabee team? And I said, you are? <laughs> I totally knew who he was, but it was, I thought it was, it was, it, it was a personal funny joke to me. My brother-in-law did that once to Tony Kornheiser at, at a book party of mine. Um, my, my sister's husband, who, who passed away tragically uh, very young, but uh, he was talking to Tony and he said to Tony, how do you know John? And <laughs> Tony was like, don't you know who I am? And David, <laughs> who did know who he was, said, no, uh, who are you? Should I know who you are? And Tony, of course, has never forgotten that. So that was a great moment. That's funny. So you initially went to Duke to be a swimmer there. But uh, so give us a little quickie on that. And when you just told us before what well, happened. Well, I, I was a decent swimmer in high school. I was recruited by a number of schools. Um, my dad very badly wanted me to go to Yale because he was actually teaching a graduate course in performing arts management there. And he'd been one of those kids growing up during the Depression uh, who had the grades to go to an Ivy League school, but didn't have the money and went to City College of New York, which at the time was one of the best schools in the country. And it was public school. So he always wanted me, I was the oldest, wanted me to go to an Ivy League school and specifically Yale since he was teaching there. And Yale did have a very good swim team and they did recruit me. But um, when I visited, I visited Yale and Duke on back-to-back -back weekends in January. Uh, and in New Haven, it was snowing. Uh, everybody was bundled up. Uh, the swimming pool, I don't know if you've ever been in Payne Whitney Gym, but it looks like a 13th century church. And the swimming pool was in the basement with no windows. And when you walked into the building, the first thing you, you smelled was the chlorine from the pool. Visited Duke a week later, it was 65 degrees. The girls were walking around in halter tops and shorts. Um, the pool was brand new with big picture windows that made you feel like you were swimming outdoors. And I went to see Duke play Maryland. Duke was terrible back then. People don't believe Duke was ever terrible in basketball. They were terrible. Maryland was ranked second in the country. And a guy named Gary Melchioni, Philadelphia guy, um, scored 39 points, Duke won, Cameron Indoor Stadium was rocking. I thought incorrectly, that's the way it was every game, and told my dad, if I get in here, I'm going to Duke. And we ended up having a big argument about it, but I did end up going to Duke. Well, it worked out. So uh, you went to Duke. Why journalism? How did you end up doing that? Was that uh, your dad's influence? And no, not really. Years? Although my dad, uh, when he was in the Army uh, in World War II, did work for Stars and Stripes and later worked for UPI briefly. Uh, so we did have that background. Uh, but uh, I broke my ankle as a freshman, um, fell down a flight of steps sober, which is still pretty embarrassing. Uh, and a friend of mine in the dorm honestly told me that the, the student newspaper, The Chronicle, was a good place to meet girls. And so I went up there and he was right, it was. But I fell in love with the work almost immediately. I write like I talk. So writing has never been difficult for me. I write very fast. Uh, it, I, I, I caught on with me uh, almost immediately. I was very fortunate that the editor was a woman named Ann Pelham who said to me, if you're, cause I came up and said, I wanted to write about sports. And she said, that's fine. But if you're serious about this, you need to know how to cover news too. So throughout my, my three and a half years at the Chronicle, 
I covered both sports and news. I was eventually managing editor of the paper, sports editor of the paper. And it turned out to be a very important thing in my life because uh, I got a summer internship at the Washington Post in sports when I graduated. When the internship was over, the sports editor, George Solomon, wanted to hire me but had no openings. And um, uh, Len Downey, who was the Metro editor who went on to become the executive editor of the paper, offered me a job as the night police reporter. And because I had some experience covering news, I wasn't intimidated by the idea. Uh, and I accepted the job because at that point, this was not long after Watergate, if I'd been offered a job sweeping floors at the Washington Post, I'd have taken it. I had a job at the Winston-Salem Journal waiting for me, but I took the, the Post job. It was a one-year thing. You went through one year of probation and eventually was hired uh, for the Metro staff for four years and then went back to sports. Um, actually, I was going to bring it up. So working at the Washington Post where Woodward and Bernstein and Catherine Graham and Ben Bradley, all those, was that just like overwhelming to know that you were in such an iconic kind of place? It was overwhelming. Uh, it, it, and it was like getting a PhD in journalism, not just because of the famous people you mentioned, but because there were so many really brilliant reporters uh, on the staff and I was surrounded by them every day. Uh, when I was a summer intern, my desk was five feet away from Bob Woodward's office. And he would walk by me in the mornings and, you know, politely kind of say good morning or something. And the second week I was there, I quote unquote broke a story because the Washington diplomats who were the North American soccer league team in town fired their coach. And I broke the story largely because nobody else cared. And it was uh, late June, uh, Washington didn't have a baseball team uh, and football camps hadn't started yet. So the, they, the story was stripped across the top of the sports page. And Woodward walked up to me that morning and said, hi, John, I'm Bob Woodward. Bob has a very distinctive Midwestern accent if you've ever heard him on TV. I get and every day. Of course, my answer should have been no blank, no kidding. You know, <laughs> like, you're Bob Woodward, no, no kidding. And I said, nice to meet you. And he said, great job this morning on the soccer coach. <laughs> and I think my answer was something along the lines of humana, humana, humana. <laughs> and I realized later that my, what my answer should have been was, yeah, thanks, Bob. Nice job on Watergate. <laughs> exactly. uh, we became, I eventually worked for him when I was on, on the Metro staff. He became the Metro editor shortly thereafter. And he became, and to this day, is a mentor of mine. Uh, he's taught me a lot, a lot about being a reporter, uh, about being a human being. Uh, and it's no fluke that he's still uh, writing books that, that make huge news at the age of 77. And I, I also got to know Bradley very well. I didn't know Mrs. Graham nearly as well because obviously the publisher didn't have much contact with the newsroom, but I did have uh, one experience with her when I was covering tennis she was a huge tennis fan. And it was the day of the U.S. Open final, 1985. John McEnroe was playing Yvonne Lendl. And you always had to get there early because of traffic in New York. And we were sitting there waiting for the match to start. And all of a sudden, Bud Collins said a few feet away from me, John, you have a visitor. And I turned around, and it was Mrs. Graham. And that was my first summer covering tennis. And I went over and said hello. And she said, John, I just wanted to come up and tell you what a great job you've done this summer covering tennis, how much I've loved your coverage. And I especially like the way you write about John McEnroe because I think he's a pretty good guy underneath it all. Mm -hmm. and I said, oh yes, Mrs. Graham, you just have to get to know him. He really is a good guy. He's got a good sense of humor on and on. Now it's two hours later, the match is about to start. We've all gone downstairs to our seats and John is ready to serve. And he's standing at the baseline and there's one person who hasn't quite made it to her seat which is in like the third row, right in front of John. It was Mrs. Graham. Sure. And he's staring at her. <laughs> and I'd seen John go off on spectator for not getting in their seats. And I, I was sitting with my friend Pete Alfano of the New York Times and, and I turned to him and I said, that's it, my career's over. <laughs> he's gonna yell at her and I'm gonna be done because I said he was a good dot, guy. And John never said a word. Yeah, Just funny. bounced the balls off his racket until she was seated. And a couple of years later, I asked him if he remembered that moment. He said, yeah, I do. I remember that old woman, right? <laughs> and I said, well, that was Catherine Graham. And by not going off on her, you probably saved my career. <laughs> Funny.
Speaking of your career, a huge impact to me anyway, because it was probably my, being a Philadelphia person, my first time uh, noticing you was when you started appearing regularly on the Sports Reporters, which started on ESPN in 1988 and ran until 2017. You were a regular panelist along with some other legends in the field of Mike Lupica and Mitch Album and Michael Wilbon and Bob Bill Ryan Conley. and all those. How did being on Sports Reporters sort of uh, increase your Q rating, as they say? I honestly don't know the answer to that, Brian. Uh, as you said, it started in 1988. Uh, I was first on that year during the basketball season. Um, I had written Season on the Brink in 1986. I had my second book had just come out, A Season Inside. Uh, so my career was going pretty well at the time. Uh, I enjoyed doing the sports reporter. I, I, I don't know what effect it had on my career, to be honest, but it was fun. We would take the show very early Sunday mornings in New York, uh, just sitting around listening to Dick Schaap tell stories, made the trip worthwhile by itself. Uh, and, and we would pre-tape the show. We would be done taping usually by 8.45 or 9 o'clock. And the show back in those days aired at 11. They eventually moved it up as early as 10. But the taping times never changed. And uh, it, it was a chance to just sit around with your colleagues before the show started and talk about what was going on. Um, I do remember uh, the one time getting into a, a, a big argument with Mitch Album, who was a big supporter of George Bush, George W. Bush, uh, before the 2006 election. And uh, we ended up ganging up on poor Mitch, Dick, and and... Dick was gone by then, I'm sorry. Um, Mike Lupica and myself, and I can't remember. By then it was just three, three of us, just me and Lupica. Uh, oh, and John Saunders. But, uh, but it was a fun show to do. That, that, that was, what was what was the most important to me about it. And of course, that was the precursor for Daily News Live. Actually in Philadelphia, way back, we had a thing called PRISM and we had a thing called the Great Sports Debate. I and remember that PRISM. was like the first TV talk show that I really, um, that I really recall. Um, we'll get touch on a couple things, and then we're going to get to all your books. Sports in the COVID All of them are 43, Brian. I don't think we need to get to all of them. <laughs> all right, well, we'll only touch on a couple of the good ones. They're all great. I was going to say. <laughs> Sports in the COVID era, all ratings seem to be down on, on, on every single sport. People, I think, thought that People were so starved for sports and people were stuck in their homes and all that kind of thing. And, but now everyone's playing, but the ratings are not down. What, uh, what is your feelings on that? What do you attribute that to? Well, I think there's a couple things involved. I think, uh, first of all, uh, people found there was a long period there where there was no sports on TV. Uh, and then golf was the first to come back after three months. Um, but people found that they could live their lives without watching sports on TV. Uh, many fans don't have the opportunity still to go to games, most fans. Uh, and, I, and I also think like when I'm a huge baseball fan, but how into a 60 game season do you get? Uh, and usually 60 games is right around Memorial Day or just after Memorial Day. I mean, the Washington Nationals were uh, 19 and 31 a year ago after 50 games and ended up winning the World Series. They were 19 and 31 ag again this year and they were all but mathematically eliminated at that point. Uh, so I think the truncation of the seasons, the ongoing concerns about what's going on with COVID. Some people will say the game shouldn't be played. Uh, you know, what, uh, watching the NBA in a, a bubble or the NHL in a bubble in August and September isn't what we're used to. The NBA playoffs are supposed to end in June. The hockey playoffs earlier in June. Uh, so I think it's 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 the truncation of the seasons, the fact that it's things are kind of out of order, uh, that people did find they could uh, get by without sports. I think whenever we do get back to normal, and I have no idea when that's going to be, and none of us do, no matter what the president says, um, you will see fans start to come back. It may not be right away, but it's like when baseball had the strike in 94, 95. It took five years for attendance to get back to where it had been, but it did come back. And I remember during that period, uh, I asked Tony La Russa how, how much this was going to damage baseball. And he said, short term, sure. But long term, baseball will come back because in the end, the game's better than all of us. 
And I basically believe that all of us who love sports, no matter what we say, no matter how disgusted we get with owners and players fighting over money, no matter how disgusted we get with college presidents lying through their teeth as they always do, we still come back to the games. We, we, we still come back to the games. And it may take a while, but I think people will come back. Well, let's get to the games real quick. Just one in particular, which is, so the Lakers are on the brink of winning a title. Mm -hmm. LeBron James, your thoughts. You know, I am uh, more impressed with LeBron James, the person and the basketball player. I, he's a great basketball player. I don't think he's in the same league with Michael Jordan. Um, maybe in the same league, but not in the same building. Uh, I think people like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Russell are underrated because they're big men and they couldn't do things that look as spectacular as what Jordan did or Bird did or Magic did or LeBron James does. Um, but I think what LeBron, LeBron James has done is what Michael Jordan has never done. And that is he's become a, a very outspoken uh, spokesman and leader on social issues. Michael Jordan, you remember famously, told Dean Smith he did not want to campaign against Jesse Helms, who was the last segregationist, openly segregationist senator in, in the United States Senate because, quote, Republicans buy sneakers too. That sort of sums Michael Jordan up to me. Mm -hmm. uh, he's come out a little bit uh, and said some things more recently, but he's still nowhere close to LeBron James. While, while Jordan's building up uh, an underwear empire, uh, LeBron James built a school in Akron. And uh, so I am extremely impressed with LeBron James as a person. I'm very impressed with him as a player. I know that because we live in an era of, you know, whatever's right in front of us is what's the best thing. There are a lot of people, a lot of my younger colleagues who will say, oh, LeBron's as good as Michael. No, he's not. He's just not. He's great, but there's only one Michael Jordan. Awesome. So also with this Lakers story, I found this, one of the most fascinating things, and I'm sure you could tell a million John Calipari stories, but <laughs> since John has been in Kentucky, he has had, you ready for this? 38 NBA draft picks, 29 first round picks, 21 lottery picks, and three number one selections. Yet, despite all that, if the Lakers do win, Anthony Davis will become the first Calipari Kentucky player to win an NBA title. I think, I think it's a more weird circumstance, thing. but it's an astounding stat. I think the more significant thing, Brian, is that with, with all of those great players, John's won, quote, only one national championship. I, th I always think it's a very unfair when you say only one national championship because winning one is very, very difficult. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because he, his best players leave every year. That's the, that's the program he created, um, the one and dones. As, as he points out all the time, he didn't invent the one and done. I would point out he more or less perfected it. Now, what's interesting is Mike Krzyzewski at Duke, who stayed away from the one and done longer than almost any big time coach. Since he, he won the national championship in 2010 with a bunch of juniors and seniors starting, none of whom have become great NBA players. Um, then he, his first one and done was Kyrie Irving in 2011. Since then, he's won one national championship. And, and again, only one. He's won five in all. But the, the only time he did win a national championship, yes, he had a couple of one and dones who were very important, but he had Quinn Cook, who was a senior. He had Emil Jefferson, who was a senior. Uh, boy. He had Marshall Plumley, who was a senior. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of interesting that the guys who have openly embraced, fully embraced the one and done, uh, have done great in terms of players going to the NBA, but maybe not as great, certainly in terms of Krzyzewski, as they had done in the past without one and dones. Uh, Ari Ackerman, by the way, did point out that he is also a proud Duke alum, just as... But let's, let's stop for a second on the proud Duke alum thing. Okay. okay. Stephen maybe Miller not. is a Duke alum. All right, so I'm not so proud these days of being a Duke alum. <laughs> by the way, but I'll speak more of Duke. I don't know if you know this, but... Our next head coach of our U.S. Open team at the next Maccabee Games is going to be John Shire, which was announced. Uh, He's a very recently. fine human being. So, um, all right, it's book club time. Season on the brink certainly changed your life. Talk about how that whole thing evolved into how it went. Well, uh, uh, 
I'll try to give you the Reader's Digest version. Uh, I had gotten to know Knight well uh, when covering his 1984 Olympic team that won the gold medal in Los Angeles. And uh, in 84, 85, when he had the worst season of his career, uh, I went to Bloomington. I showed up in Bloomington unannounced because he was turning away all media requests. And I figured if I call, they'd tell me not to come. So I flew out there and literally knocked on his door at 3.30 on a game afternoon. Again, they were playing Illinois. And I, I remember he opened the door, looked at me and said, so John, do you show up on Dean Smith's doorstep on game day like this very often? And I said, no, but usually if I call ahead, Dean will tell me it's okay to come. I wasn't sure you would. And he laughed and let me in. And we spent the next four hours talking, right? Almost till tip off. And I spent two more days there. And the day I flew home, showing my brilliant nose for news, uh, he threw the chair against Purdue. I was literally sitting in the, the office at the Post writing my story on him when the chair throw happened. So needless to say, I had to rewrite the lead. And, uh, but what I said was, while throwing a chair was inexcusable, he was thrown out, he had to be suspended, that among the crimes being committed in college athletics, on a scale of one to 10, it was probably about a three. And Knight called me after the piece ran. Usually when people call you, it's to tell you you screwed something up or they didn't like something. And he called and said, I just want to thank you for telling both sides of the, excuse me, of the story when everybody in the national media is killing me. And he invited me to a dinner that he used to have uh, back in those days on Saturday night at the Final Four. These were the days when the Final Four was still uh, a civilized event with games in the afternoon. And he, I realized he was inviting me into his inner circle. And the thought occurred to me, well, if he's willing to let me do that and he had allowed me in the locker room before the games and during halftime what game while I was out there. What if he's willing to let me do that for an entire season? There might be a book in that. I'd never written a book. I was 28 years old. Um, and so at the final four that after the dinner, I said to him, Bob, have you got a minute to talk? And he said, sure, come on back to the room. And he was rooming with the great Pete Newell as he always did at the final four. And Krzyzewski was there because they were doing a clinic together the next day. And so he and Krzyzewski talked for a while about the clinic, and I talked to Coach Newell. And when they were done, Bob said, what can I do for you? So I told him, I, I have this idea that if I came and hung out with you an entire season the way I did for those couple days back in February, there might be a good book in it. You just had your worst season ever. Uh, you're going to be bringing junior college players for the first time, which he was. Um, and I, I think there might be a book in it. And he said, have you ever written a book? I said, no. And he said, do you have a publisher? I said, Bob, I didn't think there was much sense trying to get a publisher until I talked to you first. And he said, well, that was good thinking. <laughs> so he said, well, if you can get a publisher, come on out. So Krzyzewski and I walked out the door. And the minute the door closed, he looked at me and he said, are you out of your blanking mind? And I said, what do you mean? And he said, you're volunteering to spend a whole winter with him? I said, you, you played for him for four years. He said, I needed a place to go to college. Last I looked, you've been to college. I said, well, you, you, you coached for him for a year. He said, well, I needed a job. Last I looked, you have a job. And so I said, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So long story shorter, Brian, uh, five publishers rejected the book. And finally, Macmillan offered me a contract for $15,000, which my uh, agent, Esther Newberg, managed to work up to $17,500. And I decided to do it. I wanted to write a book. I thought it could be a good book. I never dreamed it would do what it did. But I took a leave of absence from the post and moved to an apartment in Bloomington, Indiana, and spent the season and wrote the book. And you're right. It certainly changed my life. Now, when it came out, Bob might have been happy in the beginning with that first column you wrote, but he evidently was not that happy with the book when it came out, correct? Well, it's interesting because by the time I left, I knew... Bob was going to find something not to like about the book. That's, that's just who he is. He wasn't going to call me and say, you did a great job. He, he's, that's not who he is. But I never dreamed that his complaint would be that I left too much of his profanity in the book, which it was. Uh, I got a phone call from, I, I mean, obviously sent advanced copies out to Bloomington uh, before the book, a couple of weeks before the book was published to, to the coaches, to the players. And I got a call, which I found out 
sending the books to the players, if they'd given them out, which they didn't, would have been an NCAA violation uh, for some reason. But uh, Royce Waltman, who's since passed away, who was an assistant coach, called and said, John, this is your official phone call. And I said, okay, fine, Royce. And he says, coach is pissed. And I said, okay, fine, Royce. What's he pissed about? And he said, well, because you left uh, his profanity in the book. And I remember saying, no, seriously, Royce, what's he upset about? Tell me the truth. He said, no, that's it. And, you know, saying that Bob Knight used profanity is a little bit like saying tomorrow's Thursday. Uh, and maybe he just didn't realize how much he used it. I left out 95% of his profanity because if I hadn't, I'd still be writing. Uh, and I also left out a, a couple of words that he used often that were just too offensive to put in a book. But I did leave uh, uh, enough of his profanity and so people would understand how he talked and how he coached. And Bob decided that that was in some way a betrayal of, of, of our quote unquote deal. We never really had a deal. The only thing he asked me to leave out was the fact that he was going through a divorce, which I did, except for one paragraph about the fact that he had filed for divorce in court because that was a matter of public record. So he didn't love the book, um, but a lot of other people fortunately did. Um, when you look at your history of books, it's great how you, you um, expanded from, you did so many books that were about like the little unknowns, like the last amateurs, which of course, I believe the first paragraph of the book, if I remember, was all about Brian Burke, who was a player at Lafayette, who was my intern at Comcast Sportsnet as well, and who went to Germantown Academy right here. Oh, by the way, I just wanted to throw in there, one of the great trivia questions in Philadelphia basketball is we have a school, Episcopal Academy, which is where Wayne Ellington and Gerald Henderson went, and their coach was a guy named Dan Doherty. Who is the answer Dan to one of the great trivia questions of all time. Yes, so for you people who don't know, Dan Doherty was the coach of the Army in between Bobby Knight and Mike Krzyzewski. Right. Which is, uh, so that's a well-known Philadelphia thing. So you wrote your thing like the last amateurs and tales from the Q school about people trying to qualify for the PGA tour and where nobody knows your name about minor league baseball. And then you did things about Tiger Woods and the greats of tennis and all that kind of thing. What, what did you find more even enjoyable? I said, it's like our kids. We love, you love all your kids the same, but, but is there something special about sort of writing about the unknown, which your last book even is about? Right, The Back Roads to March. Um, yeah. I have always enjoyed writing about people who other people aren't writing about, uh, whether it's Patriot League basketball players or guys at Q School or guys at smaller schools, uh, like in The Back Roads to March, which I've always called the last amateurs on steroids. <laughs> but I think that... Uh, that it goes back, I mentioned working for Bob Woodward, and it goes back to a lesson he taught me very early on when I was the night police reporter. Uh, I wrote a three paragraph uh, story, a short as we called it, on a car crash in Northeast Washington one night. Uh, car crossed the median, hit another car oncoming with two people in it, and all three of them were hospitalized. Nobody died, but they were all in the hospital. I wrote three paragraphs. I came in the next morning and Woodward said to me, you know, there might be a great story in that short you wrote last night. And I said, what are you talking about? He said, what was going on in those people's lives when their lives came together like that? What were they doing? It was three o'clock in the morning. Why were they out on the road at that hour? So I went to the hospital. In those days, you could just walk into a hospital and say, what room's Brian Schiff in? And they would tell you 643 or whatever. So I had the three names and asked for their, their room numbers. And by then they were all conscious and able to talk. And as it turned out, the guy who had crossed the median was a Howard University law student who had been studying for a final. And he decided to go home and get a couple hours sleep. And as he was driving back to his apartment, he fell asleep at the wheel and crossed the median and hit this, other, this couple on coming. The couple he hit had just learned that she was pregnant with their first child. And they were actually driving out of Northeast to drive to Baltimore to see their parents, to let them know in person that they were gonna be grandparents. And I talked to all three of them. The baby, by the way, survived, thank God, uh, and wrote the story and it ended up on A1, on the front page of the newspaper. 
And Bob said to me afterwards, the lesson in that is you don't have to be rich and famous to have a story to tell. And uh, much of my reporting since then has been guided by that. That yes, people want to hear about Tiger Woods. They want to hear about uh, Mike Krzyzewski or, or LeBron James or whomever you want to name as a superstar in any sport. <coughs> but sometimes stories are more intriguing if they don't involve superstars. I have been trying to pitch a documentary, <coughs> excuse me, for several years about a guy named Eric Compton. Anybody ever hear of Eric Compton? So Eric Compton has had two heart transplants. One when he was 12, one when he was 28. After the second one, he came back to make it to the PGA Tour. And in 2014, he finished tied for second with Ricky Fowler in the US Open. To me, that's an extraordinary story. That's a story that should be told. But nobody wants to latch on to it. And HBO, one of the people I pitched the documentary to, is now doing a four-hour doc on Tiger Woods. Yawn. What are we going to learn new about Tiger Woods? Nothing. But it's Tiger Woods, so they'll be able to get sponsorships or whatever. And that's the way life works. But that doesn't stop me from believing that Eric Compton's a better story. A um, couple of things in the chat here. One is that um, people want to hear about some golf stuff, speaking of tired. So talk about your other number one bestseller, A Good, a good Walk Spoiled. Well, Good Walk Spoiled is a good example of what I'm talking about. Uh, it, it came out before Tiger Woods was on the tour. Uh, the best players in the world back then were Nick Price, Dick Faldo, um, uh, Greg Norman. They were the three, three stars on the tour. But I think what made that book as popular as it was, was people seeing that golf is not just the guys you see playing the back nine on Sunday for millions of dollars. It's guys slamming their trunks on Friday after missing a fourth straight cut. It's guys trying to get through Q school. It's guys trying to survive in AAA golf or, or mini tour golf. And I think that uh, I've always said to people, the biggest star in that book according to most of the people who read it, was Paul Goidos, who was a second-year tour player who had been a, a substitute teacher in the inner city in Long Beach, took a crack at the then Ben Hogan tour, made it to the tour, had to go back to Q school. Uh, he was, you know, Paul's five foot nine and 165 pounds, doesn't hit it a whole lot farther than your club champion, but farther, uh, and yet has played on, on either the PGA Tour or the Senior Tour for 27 years now. Won twice on the PGA Tour, four times on the Senior Tour, but it had the kind of personality that people could relate to. And a good friend of mine, Terry Hansen, who had worked at the PGA Tour, tells a story about being on an airplane on a Monday morning, shortly after a Good Walk Spoil came out. And the guy sitting next to him is reading the golf agate. And Terry turned to him and he said, so how did Goidos do? And the guy looks at him and says, how did you know I was looking up Goidos? And he said, well, if you're reading the golf agate, you're a golf fan. If you're a golf fan, there's a good chance you read a good walk spoiled. And if you read a good walk spoiled, you're a Goidos fan. And the guy said, that's amazing. You're absolutely right. So I, I, I really think that what made a good walk spoiled work was people understanding that golf, that, that for most people, playing the golf tour uh, is, is a lot harder than it looks. And that picture right there of Curtis Strange uh, who was a very successful golfer, obviously, uh, kind of sums up what it's like to play to play golf. Um, to get on that same theme of of people who are not going to be famous, I know one of your great passions is the Army Navy game and a Civil War book. So, uh, of course, as of now, that is still going to be played. I believe it's December twelfth here at the Link in Philly. So, what was your experience there going? going Army, Navy, and writing the Civil War? Well, uh, I, I knew I wanted to do a book on Army, Navy the very first time I saw the game in person. I, I grew up in New York, and, and my parents would take me once a year up to West Point to see a game, and I loved the experience. If you've never been to a game in Mikey Stadium, you should do it. Uh, when Sports Illustrated was picking the greatest sports venues of the 20th century, uh, number one was Yankee Stadium, number two was Augusta National Golf Club, and number three was Mikey Stadium. So uh, it's not my bias saying that. Um, but I, the first time I went to the game was in 1990. 
I was working for the National Sports Daily, and I wrote a long feature on the game and on the players in it and why the game mattered to them so much. And I was just incredibly impressed with all the kids I interviewed from the two schools. And at the end of the game, in those days, television didn't show the playing of the alma maters. It does now. They finally figured it out. But when the game ended, I saw the teams lining up for the alma maters. And I said to somebody, what's this? And they explained it to me that after the game, they play the alma maters. The goal is to sing second because the team that wins sings second. And I saw the players lined up shoulder to shoulder, some of them crying because uh, the seniors had played their last football game. Uh, neither team went to a bowl that year. And uh, I said, I want to write a book about this. I want to know who these guys are, what football means to them, what the Army Navy means to them, the Army Navy game means to them. It took me, long story short, five years to get to the point where both schools were willing to grant me the access I needed. And I think it was probably the most fun I ever had doing the book, or doing a book, because of the young men that I got to know. I'm still close with many of them 25 years later. In fact, we were planning a 25th reunion for the two teams together, not apart, together uh, this fall. And obviously with COVID, we're not gonna be able to have it this year. Maybe we'll have it next year on the 25th anniversary of the book's publication. But uh, every one of them knew that they weren't gonna play in the NFL. And yet they cared as much or more about football than the guys who played Alabama or Notre Dame or any of the power schools you might wanna mention. And they all understood that uh, their last college game was probably their last game. And there was incredible passion. And I, I'm, I, I think I can say fairly certainly that I am the only person who was not at the time president of the United States who had access to both locker rooms before and during an Army Navy game. Uh, and uh, it was when the book became a bestseller because my publisher hadn't want, didn't want to do it and let me do it only because I took a much smaller advance than what I normally got. Uh, that was as proud a moment for me as having a good walk spoiled and season on the brink get to number one. Got as high as number six. And it, and it is a great, great book. Thank did you. you ever have any of your books or which, which book did you go into it thinking, this is gonna be great and it's gonna be sort of, I know not that any of them are easy, but sort of easy and I have my formula down and I know I'm gonna do it. And then as you did it, it was so much harder than you had anticipated it might be. Well, I don't have a formula, Brian. So I don't think I ever uh, had that happen. I, I, um, what I, what people always ask me, one of the first questions I'm asked on book tour is, what surprised you about this book, this person, whatever it might be? And my answer usually is nothing because I don't go in with any expectations. I mean, I expected the kids at Army and Navy to be bright. I expected the Patriot League school kids to be bright, and they were. Um, so occasionally, you meet somebody who turns out to be a nicer person than you had heard uh, or than you thought. For example, I had thought that Jordan Spieth wasn't that good a guy. Uh, he, he didn't seem to do a lot of interviews. Um, he, he was always very co politically correct in what he said. And when I sat down with him in 2015 to start the research of my Ryder Cup book, I found him to be 180 degrees different than that. He was open, he was honest, he was funny. And I realized that what had happened was he was one of those athletes who was being overprotected by his agent. And in fact, at the end of that first session, I said to him, uh, you know, I'm gonna wanna circle back to you as I go through the research on this. And he said, yeah, yeah, do me a favor, just take my cell phone number so you don't have to go through Jay to get to me, just call me anytime. And I'm telling you, Brian, he has never failed to return a phone call, never failed to return a text. Uh, he's very self-deprecating. And uh, so that, that was a surprise to me. I try not to have any um, uh, preconceptions about anyone or anything, but I did have something of a preconception about Jordan because of what I'd read from him and what I'd seen of him. Uh, and it turned out, delightfully so to be uh, 180 degrees wrong that's great so um i knew this was going to happen that this could be another three hours long and it won't be when it only has another 10 minutes or so so tell us and i know for years you had a weekly lunch with red hour back and i know everybody here would love to hear stories about you and red and i know a variety of other coaches also 
randomly joined in with you? Well, the, the lunches uh, were with usually anywhere from eight to 15 guys, uh, depending on who was, you know, who had free time. Uh, that's us at a restaurant in downtown DC called the China Doll. And what's remarkable about that photo is that I'm not talking <laughs> and, and that I shut up and let Red talk. Uh, I learned early on that if you were around Red Auerbach and you didn't shut up and let him talk, you were an idiot. Um, but the funny thing is the way I got to be part of the lunches, uh, when uh, in, in 19, I wanna say 93, my friend Dan Shaughnessy from the Boston Globe approached Red about doing a book on him. And Red said to him, yeah, I'll do it. Just don't do to me what that blank did to my friend Bobby Knight. Bob and Red were very close. And so Dan, of course, couldn't wait to report this back to me, that Red thought I was a blank. And I didn't know Red at that point, even though he lived in Washington. Red lived in Washington throughout his adult life, uh, even when he was coaching the Celtics. And um, so I thought, okay, fine, Red Auerbach doesn't like me. Well, one night in 1999, he and I were, without me knowing it, scheduled to be on a local TV show. Uh, at the, not at the same time, but the same evening. And we ended up in the, in the green room together. And I thought, oh, God, this is going to be awkward. But when he walked in, I walked over. I said, Coach, hi, how are you doing, John Feinstein? Hey, John, good to see you. How are you? And I said, yeah, great. So I thought, ah, he's 81. He doesn't remember who I am. And we sat down. And Red, of course, lit up a cigar in a non-smoking building. And he said, how's your buddy? And I said, my buddy? He said, yeah, your buddy, Bobby Knight. And I said, well, coach, you know, we're not exactly buddies. And he goes, oh, I know, he hates you. <laughs> and uh, I said, yeah, but he doesn't hate you. He loves you. And Red smiled and he said, yeah, but that's because I never wrote a book on him. <laughs> I was aware of these Tuesday lunches at a Chinese restaurant through Jack Cavance, who was then the athletic director at George Washington. Red's a graduate of George Washington, worked out there all the time went to all the games and was friends with basically everybody in the GW athletic department. And so Jack had told me about these Tuesday lunches and I thought if I could go to one of those lunches, I could get a column out of it. So I called Jack and Jack said, you know, you should get Morgan Wooten to ask him because if Morgan asks him, he'll probably say yes. And then fortunately I knew Morgan, the great DeMatha high school coach. And Morgan said, yeah, I'll call him. And so he called back and said, Red says, come ahead. So I went on a Tuesday um, and at the end of the lunch, Zhang Auerbach, who sort of organized the things every week, his Red's brother, said to me, anytime you want to come back, come on back. Oh, thank you. I thought he was being polite. So I wrote the column. And about three weeks later, I got a call on a Monday night from Zhang. And he said, well, where have you been? And I said, what do you mean, where have I been? He said, at lunch. And I said, well, I didn't know I was invited back. And he said, what part of come back anytime did you fail to understand? So I started going every single week. And after, I don't know, a year or two maybe, all the other guys were saying, you gotta, you gotta write a book. You gotta put these stories on paper. They need to be preserved. But I didn't want Red to think that I was coming to lunch to try to get a book. So I never said anything. And finally one day in his typical fashion, he turned to me and he said, so are we gonna do a book or not? I said, well, do you want to? He said, yeah, why not? We did the book. It was an extraordinary experience. To sit. I was getting paid to sit around and listen to Red Auerbach tell stories. And um, uh, the book was, was called Let Me Tell You a Story. And Red passed away on Halloween in 2006. Um, miss him every day. He, he was like the jock grandfather to my son, Danny. Uh, but we still have the lunches. Not right now because of COVID, but we kept having the lunches because I think all of us understood that Red wanted us, would have wanted us to keep having the lunches. My first experience with Maccabi USA or one of them was I was covering, there was a guy in Philly, a player named Jimmy Kaiserman, who actually is Harry Litwack's grandson. Jimmy was trying out for the U.S. Maccabea team. And what they did then in 1993, there was a tryout in New York, in Chicago and Los Angeles and all the finalists had to come to the Smith Center in Washington because um, Scott Beaton was going to be one of the coaches. He was an assistant at GW. And um, Mike Cohen, who was at Wichita State, was going to be the head coach. And they had the finals was everybody, 35 guys had to come to the Smith Center to the final tryout. And Red was there at the tryout the whole weekend. And I have a picture somewhere in my uh, 
picture book of all the players sitting around Red Auerbach in the stands. And he was there every day. He was loving it. He was loving all the Jewish players that were that were all there. Red 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 loved loved the game and and trying to help younger players right till the day he died. I went with him to what turned out to be his last opening night in Boston in 2005. And uh, the Celtics were terrible that year, as it turned out, but they won that night. And Doc Rivers was the coach, and he asked Red to speak to the team after the game, which he did. And when he was done, he turned to a guy named Dan Dickow. You might remember Dickow, played at Gonzaga, a very good player. And he said, Dan, i got to ask you a question. Yeah, coach, what is it? And he says, are there baskets on the left side and right side of the court? And Dan said, well, no, coach, there aren't. And he said, then why the blank do you keep dribbling left and right and left and right? Go to the basket for crying out loud. And that was, that was Red. My grandfather used to tell this joke all the time. A guy learned about gambling. I'll, I'll tell you the short version. So a guy told him about gambling. He bet NBA games on Friday, lost everyone. Bet college football on Saturday, lost everyone. Bet the NFL on Sunday, lost everyone. Bet Monday night football on lost. And Tuesday, he called the bookie and said, um, what do you got tonight? And the guy said, tonight, all I got is hockey. And he went, hockey? What do I know about hockey? So... One thing I noticed was you haven't written any books about hockey. True. Uh, and I love hockey, as a matter of fact. I grew up in, in, in New York. I went to Ranger games as a kid. And then when I got a little older, went to Islander games all the time. And I have made a couple of attempts, a couple stabs at trying to write a hockey book. I know what I'll call it. I'll call it a season on the rink. <laughs> uh, so all I need now is a book. But several years ago, I tried to put together a book uh, on Sidney Crosby and Alexander Ovechkin, because the Penguins and the Caps were big rivals at the time. Uh, to a large degree, they still are. But back then, you know, the Penguins won three Stanley Cups, had to go through the Caps, it seemed, every year. And, uh, you know, Crosby's the Canadian hero, Ovechkin's the Russian, the anti-hero in Canada. And uh, I had good connections here in Washington with the team, and, and I think I would have gotten the cooperation there. I actually went to Gary Bettman, for help with Crosby. And he put me in touch with Crosby's agent who said he would talk to the father because the father controls the kid's career to a large degree. And the father refused to even allow me to meet with Sydney. So it shut down then. What I'd really like to do uh, someday is write a book just on a year with the Islanders. The Islanders are probably the professional team I'm most passionate about in wow. my life with apologies to Flyer fans at the moment. But I don't know why uh, maybe because I covered them when they were great. Uh, I used to come back from the Final Four in the early 80s, and I would be sent out to cover the NHL playoffs because I was the only guy on the staff other than the Caps beat writer, Bob Fache, who liked hockey. And I always ended up covering the Islanders because they were the best team and got to know the, that entire group, you know, the, the Trottier and Potvin and Billy Smith and Bob Bourne and Bob Nystrom and Al Arbor and Bill Torrey and and, and loved covering that team. And so I probably because of those fond memories, I'm still passionate about that. The low point of my personal sports life was when Bobby Nystrom scored that goal against the Flyers. 7-11 of overtime, May 24th, 1980. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. I'm going to just let me give you a couple of quickies here because there's so many questions in the chat and I knew this was going to happen. Um, what do you think, a, a short version of what's going to happen with college basketball this season? It's like with every question that, that involves COVID, the honest answer is I don't know. Um, they're hoping to start on November 25th, two weeks after the season was supposed to start. Um, teams are gonna play anywhere from five to seven non-conference games and then get into conference games. There are still plans to perhaps go into bubbles as the season goes on if need be. The NCAA tournament has a plan to play in a bubble if need be, they have already trademarked the phrase battle in the bubble in case that happens. Uh, there's been a group of coaches meeting by Zoom once a week, big, you know, big name coaches like Izzo and Krzyzewski and Roy Williams and uh, I'm blocking on the others, but big name coaches, uh, Bill Self. Uh, and, and the goal of that group is one thing, make sure there's a tournament because they lost $450 million last year not having a tournament. So one way or the other, I think we'll ultimately have a tournament uh, unless COVID gets so bad during the winter that we're all forced back completely inside, which is possible. 
but I think they're, they're going to do everything they can to have a tournament. And if they have to have it in May or June, they'll have it in May or June. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. Personally, I have to thank some people I see on there. Coach Marty Rigger, my all-time hero, who's from Florida, the great coach at Brentwood High School on Long Island, was Mitch Kupchak's high school coach. Danny Hers, Art Cratchman, so many great people on here. Whoever I miss, you know I love you anyway. And um, John, can't thank you enough for doing this. Um, you know, you are uh, you're a special guy. I see Irv Mins from Canada on here too, who Irv's son also played in the Patriot League at Lafayette, Jared Mintz. I don't know if you remember him. You probably did from, because John also was a, uh, the color analyst on Patriot League basketball as well. All the people who put in questions at the chat that I didn't get to, I'm sorry. Obviously, as I said right in the beginning, nobody has more breadth of knowledge than John. It's so easy to uh, talk about 10 million things with him, but this was super, super special. And on behalf of Maccabi USA, John, I can't thank you enough. Of course, all of John's 35 plus books are available. 43. We're 40, okay, he's up to 43. I didn't want, I didn't want to see, I know journalism, accuracy, accuracy, accuracy. I wasn't sure the exact number, so I just was going with more than. So they're all available, Amazon, Kindle, wherever you buy and read your normal books. Every one of them's better than the next. Um, I love them all, especially by the last shot because I'm in that <laughs> as well. So thanks again, John. This was great. I'm glad your wife and school enjoyed the pizza. Hopefully you saved the slice for yourself as well. Grab the